All right, let's remember Brother Finley in prayer, and uh, he's a blessing to this church, and uh, to uh, and I know to our pastor, and uh, so you, you pray for Brother David, and the Lord bless and take, take care of him. I'm sure he'll be traveling as far as soon as he can down to Haiti to be a uh, to be with Miss Connie and to uh, to help in whatever way he can, and because uh, that's just the kind of guy he is. He, he just he's he's a selfless servant of the Lord, and uh, that's the uh, that's the most wonderful kind of servant that uh, that you can ever be, and uh, so tonight we're in chapter number sixteen of the book of Genesis. Chapter number 16. Can't believe we're already to chapter 16. Uh, you know, when you, when you first uh, read chapter 16, uh, you think, well, well, God's through with the covenant now, and he can get on into the other things. No, wait a minute. He's not through with the covenant yet. He's going to tell us a little bit more about it, and then even a little bit more in chapter 17. And then, you know, see, we had to get from Abram to Abraham. And to do that, you have to get all the way to chapter 18. Amen? And so here we go in chapter number 16. The permissive will of God. Israel, uh, Ish, uh, excuse me, Ishmael is not the promised seed. You know, when you, when you try to help God out, most of the time it doesn't work out to his, his glory but it does to your own. And here we have uh, this thing, the permissive will of God. What is the permissive will of God? The permissive will of God is what God will allow you to do if, if you beg him enough. He'll let you go ahead and do whatever you want to do. But he'll have to, you'll have to bear the consequence of the result. And so here we have, uh, here we have this. Uh, the, the, the thing uh, that we're going to see in, in, the, in this chapter is, is what Paul wrote about in chapter 4 of Galatians. And we're going to be turning over there after a while. Uh, but uh, I want us to, to read just a little bit here in chapter 16. Now Sarah was Abram's wife, and she bare him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. Reckon how long she had been there. I got a feeling that she came back when they left Egypt and came out into Canaan. And I've got a feeling that, uh, you know, that wasn't a really good idea. You know, they brought back some things that they really didn't need. And here's one of them. All right, and so her, her name was Hagar, which means flight. In other words, she's... She's the one that's going to run, and, uh, and, and, and certainly she did at least twice. But it says, And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. You, you notice what she's saying there. She's blaming God because she can't have any children. That's not a good thing to do. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not what, you know, God... God is able. God is able. But there had to have been a reason for him not to give her children at this point in her life. And, and so the, she, she says, the, 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 Jehovah has restrained me from bearing. And so she has, she's, she's, she's upset with God just a little bit. If, can you see that in her, in her, in her tone? The Lord. Did this? He restrained me from bearing. She said, "This wasn't my fault." I don't know about you, but I, I, I think back to Ab to Adam, and uh, Adam is just eating of the fruit, and and uh, you know, he, and uh, God says, "What's what's this? Why why did why did why are you telling me all these things? Have you eaten of that tree?" And he said, "It wasn't my fault. It was the woman." It was her. She did it. And now the woman is getting back at the man. <laughs> and so we say, see here that, uh, uh, that she says that the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. 
I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Now, that doesn't even seem right to me uh, in, in the 21st century. How that Sarah's going to have children because of this other woman having a baby. That's not, that's, not, uh, that's not even thinking right. And I don't think she was thinking right at this moment in her life because she was thinking, my goodness, the things that I'm going through are going to be uh, eternal. And I, we're supposed to get all these blessings and we're supposed to be a blessing and we're supposed to have this seed and, and it's supposed to be as, as, as the sand of the sea for multitude, and we're supposed to have all of these things. And I can't even have a child. So she's, she's, her bitterness is showing in, in the things that she's saying. And Abram uh, hearkened to the voice of Sarai. I don't know about you, but this, this, this was not the right thing to do. Has God said, Abram, go into to Hagar and have a child, and I'll use him instead. No, he hadn't said that. All he said is, I'm going to give you a seed. And this seed is going to be, uh, the, and the, the Messiah is going to come through this seed. And we're going to, he's going to be, your, your children are going to be like the, the sand by the seashore for n- numbers. And so Abram hearkened unto the wi- a voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had, dealt, had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. Now, I don't know if they, if they were having this conversation at the beginning of the 10 years or at the end of the 10 years, but she might not have given her to her until wait, a little bit longer. Maybe she was waiting just to see. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Lord will deal bountifully with me. Maybe the Lord will deal well with me. But uh, at, uh, after they had dwelt there 10 years in the land of Canaan, he, he gave and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife and to do the things that wives do and to be a a wife unto him. And uh, now now Sarai is probably in her 90s by this this time. Now she's she's thinking that that there's no way, you know, it's it's physically and and according to nature it's, it's... it's impossible for, for, for me to have a child now. And, uh, and so what did he do? He was a faithful husband. He went into her. Now, I don't know, but uh, God didn't say go into there. And so Abram did this on his own. You notice Abram is not Abraham yet. He wasn't the, he wasn't the wise man. He went into Egypt. He should have stayed in Canaan. Now he goes into Hagar, and he should have stayed with Sarai. And so he's got a problem with some of the things that he is doing and some of the things that he is allowing himself to do. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. She looked at at Sarah differently now. Now what is she supposed to be? She's supposed to be a handmaid. What do handmaidens do? They serve. But now she's looking at Sarah like, uh-huh, I'm your equal. So handmaidens are not equals to their, to their, their masters. And you think, well, you know, the, the, God doesn't like slavery, but God allowed it. He allowed it for thousands of years. And uh, the, the, the thing of slavery, the thing about slavery is that you lose all of your rights, your personal rights, and, and you have to, you're, a, you're basically the property of another. I noticed that, that uh, her mistress was despised in her eyes, and now she looks at her like, I, I'm your equal and not your subservient one anymore. And Sarah, I said unto Abram, I shouldn't have done that. No, she didn't say that, did she? (laughs) She didn't say that. She said, my wrong be upon thee. This is your fault, Abram. 
you, you, you did this. No, Abram didn't do this. Sarai is the one that hatched up this idea. It was one of those subtle suggestions, you know. Well, what if you just do this? We can, have, we can get a child out of this, and, and, uh, and, and uh, this will be the one, you know. God gives the one. God, God gave us Jesus, born of a virgin, a virgin. Now, I mean, that means she had never been with a man. And the Holy Spirit caused her to conceive. And she brought forth a, her firstborn. And sure enough, it was just like the angel said, that it, it was a male child. And, he, and she called his name Jesus, because that's what they told her to. And so here we have, he says, I've, uh, my, my wrong be upon thee. I've given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she, was, she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. In other words, she wasn't doing what I told her to anymore. And the Lord, he said, she says, and Jehovah judged between me and thee. And uh, you know what? Uh, a, uh, the problem is here uh, that she wanted children so bad, she was willing to bow down to the ways of the world instead of trusting in God. She wanted children so bad. And so Hagar conceived and she was despised and, and Sarah was, Sarai was despised. And then she tells him, boy, I gave her to you, but I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have done that because uh, now look what's happened. And then she says that God will judge who did the worst wrong? Who did the worst thing? Did, was it Sarah or was it Abram? I think they're pretty much equals. I think they both did wrong, you know. And two wrongs never make a right. Two wrongs. And so uh, there was two wrongs here. And, uh, boy, they were just, uh, they, they, they could look at each other and they say, you're the problem, and they would be right, and they, and that's what happened. And uh, so she, uh, uh, she, she says, uh, and, but Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. In other words, she's your problem. Deal with it. You know, have you ever been told that? Just deal with it. Just deal with it, you know. But when you've gotten into sin and, and you have fallen away from the way that God wanted you to walk and what God wanted you to go, we usually try to shift the blame to somebody else. And that's what both of them were doing. It's her fault. And no, it's, no, it's his fault. And, and we, we see this. And so he just tells her, he says, she's your, she's your maiden uh, and uh, he says, do with her as it pleases thee. Now, she still was, see, Sarai was still under her husband's authority. And she, she gave that, uh, she gave that uh, authority up <laughs> to, by, by virtually giving the, her, him this, this woman to be a second wife for him. And so when uh, Sarai dealt hardly with her, that is with Hagar, she fled from her face. So here's, here's this, she, this runaway sl slave. She's running and she's running and she's running. And she comes to a fountain of water down in the, in the desert. And, uh, you know, she's run away now. She's, she's on the lamb, as they, as they say. She's, she's running and she's trying to get away. She's, she's on her way back to Egypt. You know what she would have gotten when she got back to Egypt? More of the same, because they would have put her right into slavery, because now she was tainted because she was a part of these, these uh, Hebrew people. And so the, uh, and she, uh, she fled from the face uh, of her master. And verse 7 is a turning point in this chapter because we see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see a Christophany. 
What is a Christophany? That is, a, in the Old Testament, a pre, uh, pre-life uh, uh, appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this happens over 2,000 years before he's, Christ is born into the world. And so the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the, in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid. Didn't say, Hagar, Sarah's equal. Hagar, you, you're just as good as she is. Didn't say that. He told her what she was. Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou? How come you're here? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, It's okay, you'll be all right. Just, just do whatever you please and, uh, you know, it'll be okay. And uh, at, no, that's not, what, that's not what he said to her. What did he say to her? He said, return to thy mistress. He said, go back. Go back. This is all God's plan. You see, there's a plan that God has for each and every one of us. And the thing that God wants us to do is to follow the plan. How many, how many of us realize that if you follow the plans, uh, you, you actually get a better result than if you try to do the plans, uh, to try to do the job before you've read the plans? I mean, they, you know, this, this building was built, uh, and somebody had some plans. Now, I don't know who, who had the plans, and I don't know if they, if they had drawn them up themselves, but there's a lot of people that know how to draw these plans up, and here we have a building standing for, for a low on to 40-something years, and here we have uh, a wonderful structure that we, we worship in and, uh, and, uh, and the Lord's blessing us in. Uh, but you know what? Uh, the plans, they, they had to do that to complete the building. They had to follow the plans. You know, some people might say, well, let's put the, let's put this, the roof on first. And, uh, you know, how, how many of you have ever built a, a building and you, you started by building the roof? Yeah. Not too many, you know, because you don't get very far that way. But you start with your foundation and you have to build on the foundation. And that foundation that we build on here would be Jesus Christ as the church of the living God. And so he says, uh, go back. Go back to where you belong and submit thyself unto her hands. Now, he said, you're not her equal. Now, you know, in the human race, everybody's sort of an equal. But in, in the, uh, the, the hierarchy of authority, she was not in charge of anything except serving her mistress. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. Who? The angel of the Lord. Jesus Christ. You say, well, this is a pre-incarnate uh, version of Jesus Christ here. He's, this is before he came into the world. And, 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 and he's, he comes in as an angel. And, and, he, and, he, and he meets with this woman who's at the, at the end of her rope because she's, uh, she's run away from her mistress. She can't go back there. She can't go forward, and she's expecting. Now, she's in a bad way. But God comes to her, and he says, just go back. It'll be all right. He said, this is what's going to happen. I'm, he's, and he begins to tell her things that are, that are in the future for her. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful to know what, what we're, we're, our whole purpose and point in life is? Well, he told this woman, your, pro, your point in life is to serve and to complete the job that, that you have in this world. And so he says, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude." That's almost as much as what God promised to Abram and Sarah, that their seed would be as the sea, sand by the seashore for number. 
much more. And uh, so the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael. And that name means God shall hear. Did you believe that God heard her when she ran down into the wilderness? God heard her, and she was an Egyptian. You wouldn't think that God would hear an Egyptian of all people. You know, it, that's a descendant of Ham. And that's a descendant of those that, that were cursed. And, and, uh, she, and he says, it's, you know, the reason is, is because the Lord has heard your affliction. God always hears the affliction of his people. And he takes care of them. And then he tells a little bit about this little baby that's going to be born. Oh, he's going to be the most precious little fellow. He's going to be just as kind and calm as, as can be. And he's, no, he says this, he will be a wild man. Have you ever had a child and you said, this is a wild child. <laughs> this is one of those that, that you can't do anything with. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. Everybody he comes up to, he wants to fight. I, I've, I've, I've known some people that all they want to do is fight. They, they don't care about anything. Uh, they get it, you know, somebody comes along and, and does, does something they don't like, and they just want to fight. They just want to be a fighter, you know. God didn't call me to be a fighter, by the way. Uh, God called me to be a preacher. And when he, when he called me to do that, he, he took all the fight out of me. It's not, it's not like, of course, when I had my heart attack, when somebody calls on the phone and, and, uh, and they try, try to sell me something that I don't want, uh, I, don't, I don't treat them kindly like I used to. I think it's something to do with all the medicine they're giving me. I don't know. But I want to blame that, you know. I'm, I'm going to throw some things off for somebody else too. <laughs> but, you know, as, as we, uh, Abram's reply was to uh, do what pleases you, Sarah. And so he do she does, and she de treats her harshly, you know. She treats her like she deserved to be treated as a servant. And I think that's what Abram was telling her. She said, do, do what you're supposed to do. And, and she did, and she ran away. But it took God to bring her back. The angel of the Lord, the Christophany. And uh, there's another word for that, uh, uh, theophany. And so you could, you could use either one in there, but we believe it was Christ that had met with her and uh, was, was telling her these things. And so uh, she, uh, uh, she, she, you know, boy, she, uh, he, he shall dwell. Uh, everybody's, he's going to be against everybody, and everybody's going to be against him. And that's, that's where Ishmael was. He was, he was a man that was a wild man, and, uh, but he was a blessed man because God blessed him. You know, we can't say that Ishmael was not a blessed man. Didn't, didn't God say that everybody that had something to do with, with Abraham would be a blessed man? And he did, and he was. And so she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou seest me. And that's what she called the name of the Lord there. And when, when, when Jesus saw, uh, when Jesus saw things, uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing. When he saw things, he could tell what people were going to do and what people were going to say and what people were thinking. And uh, he saw her, and, uh, and that, was a, that was a wonderful thing. Thing. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeketh me? I, did I look for you to come? Did I ask you to come? No, but you came anyway. And, and he came by the well of water. And when, when we see a well of water, and this is a fountain of water, and that speaks to us of the Holy Spirit. A fountain of water, that's one that, that gushes up. A fountain of water. It wasn't just a simple well. It was like an artesian well. Uh, an artesian well is a is a is the pressure so great under the ground that it pushes the water up. 
and it's bubbling up all the time. And that's uh, still water now, this picture of the Holy Spirit, is the Word of God. And so as we, as we look into the Bible, we, we can see some of these things. And boy, when, when you see those things, uh, just stop for a second and give God a little glory because he's shown you something out of his word. And so she, and so she called the name of that place. Wherefore, the well was called Beer Lahoy Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And uh, so there she was, and she's named this place. He, he saw me here, and, uh, and, and he got, she got the help that she needed. She needed a friend, and she needed somebody to talk to her. And that's what the Lord did. You didn't see her talking back, did you? Just him talking, him telling her, now this is the way it's going to be. Now this is what you do. You just run on back down there, and you just be a good servant. And you just do what God wants you to do. You know, there's a lot of preachers that, that uh, they, they're not pastoring a thousand-member church, so they're thinking that, oh, I, I'm not doing anything for God. You know, the average church in the independent Baptist movement is probably about the number of people that we have. The average independent Baptist church is not thousands of members, you know. Very few, very, very few pastors ever get the big church, you know. Everybody that comes out of a seminary wants the big church. They want to be the, the pastor of this big, huge congregation and everything. And, you know, you know what? God needs some people that will have the humility to pastor little churches. He needs the people that will be willing to do the little because God, little is much when God is in it. I like that song, don't you? Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. What a, say, what a song that is and what a Savior we serve. And so Hagar went back. and She, she bore Abram's son. And, uh, and Abram called his son's name which Hagar bare, Ishmael. Now, isn't that amazing? I, don't, I, I guess she told him what, God, what, the, what Christ had told her, or that God had told her. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Abram was 86 years old. 86. Wow. I thought nobody but Tom Wages over in uh, the, the, the Undertaker uh, had children when he was that old. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> All right, and so we're going to look over now in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter number 4. And uh, we have this, this son that's born. He's, he's born. He's, he's not going to be the promised seed. Now, I, I, you know, all of, all of you Muslims that may be looking in, I'm sorry. But Ishmael was not the chosen seed. It was Isaac. Ishmael was not the chosen seed. You see, his birth was not the way that God wanted it to be. All right, and so he is the son of the bondwoman. And... Isaac is the son of the free woman. Verse number nine, uh, 17 is, uh, begins this, this section in, uh, in Galatians that we, that we want to read. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, that is after the promises were made, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. You see, the, pro the promises were made to Abraham, and there was never a, an expiration date given on those promises. God didn't say, I, uh, until I send the law. He could have said that, but he didn't. He said, I'm, I'm telling you that this is perpetual. 
This is from now on. This is, the, this is all the way down. This is never going to end. And, uh, and then he says, For it is, uh, if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And then he says, Wherefore then serveth the law? What good is the law? You know, the law is very good. The law is what teaches and, and, and instructs us in, into what sin is. What sin is. And so when, when we look at the law, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God's not just trying to be almighty, because he is. But, he, but he's trying to tell, teach us that there are no other gods than him. And, and then he, and, and so he said, what, where then serveth the law? And, and the law, those five, last five things that teach us how to, how to act around people, how, how, to, how to be a good uh, steward of God's law is to follow those five things. And he, and he, told, he told them that uh, on, uh, on two things hang the whole law. Don't have any other gods before me. And uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength. He said, that's it. He said, the whole law hangs on those two things. So when he said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and thou shalt not commit adultery. He tells them those things, and he tells us, this is what sin is. Don't do these things. You know what people do? They go and they do them anyway. Because they don't understand that that is sin. It's not just, uh, you know, oh, I, I didn't know. It was just not just a mistake. Some people say, sin is just a mistake. No, sin is not a mistake. Sin is a conscious, deliberate act against God. Sin. So he says, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of the transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And uh, so he, he teaches us here that the seed that's coming is the important one. Who was that seed? And so he, he goes on and he, he begins to tell us. He says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Some people say, God is three. He's three. No, he's one. God is one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the Godhead. He is one God. And we should understand that. All right, and so he says, Is the law then against the promises of God? And he says, God forbid. And the words God forbid means, let that be the farthest thing from your mind. Don't even think about it. Don't entertain that idea. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. How many people got right with God because of the law? Not one. Because the law wasn't given to make men right. It was to make them understand what sin was. And, and the Jew, when, when they added all those things unto the law, uh, some some thousands of, of little things that they added on. Well, you know, we, we think you're too stupid to understand this, so we're going to help you out. Isn't that, isn't that what the world does? And that's all a part of the world. That's all a part of the things of the world. But he says this, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, pedagogus, the, it, it, an instructor. It was to teach us. The law was to teach us exactly what God said about sin. To bring us under Christ. And if, if the law doesn't bring you to Christ, 
then you'll not have been brought to Christ. That we might be, what, justified by faith. And that, that brings us into a legal term, justification. And, and, and it means that we are, uh, we are made uh, as, as pure and clean as the, as the day we were born. We were born little sinners, though, so that doesn't really help us out. Justified, made just as if we had never sinned. Made in the, in the way that God wanted us to be. God wants us to be justified. He wants us to live a justified life and a life that, uh, that exhibits the faith that we have. But he says, but after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. He says, for you're all the children of God by faith in, in Christ Jesus. Now let's turn over uh, one page. And he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I'm travailing in, in, in birth. You know, uh, we, we had four children and uh, I, I didn't travail at all. But I felt, I felt some, something that was, uh, you know, uh, when the first child, uh, they wouldn't let me in to the room uh, to where the baby was being born, because they just didn't do that in 1972. And, uh, you know, so uh, at least not at Joan Clancy Hospital. <laughs> but the good thing was that uh, the doctor was uh, Diane's cousin. And uh, so he was, uh, he, she got really good, good uh, 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 treatment while she was in there, because he was the head of the hospital. I desire, he said, you to be present now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. You see, in the book of, of Galatians, we, we find that people were trying to add the law back to grace. Add the law to the gospel. And keep the law. You've got to keep the law too. No, God didn't tell us to keep the law. But he did tell us to let the law do in us what what it's what it was designed to do, and and uh, we've you know if we do that, we'll we'll be okay, because we won't kill, we won't steal, we won't bear false witness, we won't covet, and we won't commit adultery, and we'll we'll be just in the sight of God, and that's what he's trying to tell us, and so he, he says, tell me you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law, for it is written, that Abraham had two sons. Oh, here we have it. Going all the way back to chapter 16, we're going to find out about one of the sons. And in chapter 17, we'll find out about the other one. And he says, uh, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So you got, you got two women. You got one that, uh, th that's a servant, and the other is a free woman. She's, she's a bond slave. She's a slave. But he was, that was born of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. In other words, the old nature. It was born after the flesh. You have the law on one side and grace on the other side. And he was born under the law. He was born under the law, but the other one was born under grace. And notice that he says this, but he of the free woman was by promise. God had made the promise. Now, some people would say, well, Ishmael was given by promise too. No, he wasn't. That was just an impe impetuous moment in Abram's life. You say, well, I don't believe that. I think he committed adultery. Yeah, probably God thought so too. But there was no law then. Moses hadn't been given the law on Mount Sinai. And so he, was, uh, he could say, well, wait a minute. I'm just doing it what, what uh, I knew to to do the best that I could do, which things are an allegory? How many? Who, who can tell me what an allegory is? It's a, it's the it's the difference between two things. It's, there's an allegorical. It, it uh, it's one represents one thing, and the other, the diametric opposite of it. It's an, an allegorical thing. Now, I put you on the spot. 
But if you, if you don't believe me, just you, you get, your, get your thing out and say, Google, hey, Google, <laughs> what's an allegory? And it'll tell you that it's, uh, it's Al Gore. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, these are two covenants, two covenants. There's two covenants that's dealt with here. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. That's who that Hagar is. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which, is, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. And so uh, Paul says, now you got two, two covenants that we're talking about here, the covenant of the law, and then we have the covenant of grace. Law and grace. You know, uh, Lester Roloff preached a message on Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And, and that message was, was one of his classic messages that he ever preached in his life. And he was talking about the two natures. And he went to this passage and he told about uh, Ishmael and Isaac and how they, they were Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And Dr. Law could never do what Dr. Grace could do, justify a man. Notice that he says, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the des desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Oh, what's, what's going on here? If you had just waited a little longer, you could have seen God do something marvelous and given you that child that you, you got, but after a whole lot of turmoil in your life. Now we, he says, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We are the children of promise. We have the same promises that were made to Abram when he was given this covenant that never ends. It's an everlasting covenant to go on through eternity. It'll go on through eternity, not just till the end of time as we know it, but until eternity. And it says, but as then he was that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. He said, it's all going on now. The children of Ishmael are opposed to the children of Isaac. And then he says this in verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? You see, when it all comes down to it, the word of God is the final word. The final word. He says, cast out the bondman, bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They weren't, they were, they were sent out. And we're going to see that in just a, a few weeks as, as uh, uh, she goes out, she goes back out into the wilderness again. But this time the angel of the Lord doesn't come and call her to go back. But she'll, she'll be sent on off. All right, and so, so then... She, he says, brethren. So who is he talking to here? People that believe. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You see, Paul is trying to drive home this understanding to the people. You don't have to add one thing to, to by grace through faith. Because if you try to add something to it, it's no, it's no longer grace, but it's works. And the works, he said, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, it, and every man would. If he could, boy, look what I did. I, I deserve to go to heaven. Nobody deserves heaven. We all deserve hell. It's only by the mercies of God that we can come to him. 
in grace. And he gives us that. We're not children of the bondwoman. We're not children after Hagar. We are children after the picture of Sarai, who became Sarah, and, and all because she laughed. She laughed. We're going to see some wonderful things as we go on here. You know, you know there's, there's more to this than, than just you read in your just common reading. As, as we look at these things, uh, is, is God not telling us a lot about what he, deser- he, de- he deserves from us? He deserves glory and praise and honor and adoration from his children. Why? Because he has done so much for us even from the days of Abram. Now, we're not through with the covenant yet. There's a little bit more about the covenant that we have to see and uh, this covenant of promise. And, uh, and, and this is probably, uh, for, for the people there, uh, the most demonstrative thing that they could ever see uh, or, or experience because of the things that God was going to show them in these things, that we don't need to be children of the flesh, but of the Spirit. You know, Romans chapter 8, we're to walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, the Spirit of of God in us. What a wonderful thing that is. And so that is chapter number 16 in Genesis. And the things that we're going to see now from now on, are going to bring us to the place where we see the nation of Israel becoming a reality. But right now, they're they're Hebrews because they were the descendants of Eber. But they're not they're they're not the Israelites, and uh, they they were called Jews, and uh, yet they they were in a wonderful position to do what God wanted them to do because now they're, they're going to have the whole covenant to follow after. And it's going to be a, a wonderful life that they live from now on. But you know, they're still not perfect people. And we'll, we'll find that out too in the next cap, couple of chapters. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we're so grateful for the opportunity to, to study your word, Lord, and to show forth these things that will glorify you. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us and help us through them. Help us to strengthen our faith and strengthen the things, Lord, that, uh, that you show us that we could be those kind of servants that glorify you in the end as we do in the beginning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We thank you if- for listening in today, and if, you, uh, if you'd be so kind as to tune in again on, uh, on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, pastor is preaching on the, uh, uh, the uh, second coming, and uh, he's doing a tremendous job, and you need to come and be a part of that in the service, amen? And uh, let's see, let's see this, this church uh, alive with people because these are things that are coming that we need to see and we need to understand. And uh, it's time that you do it because the days are drawing close. Amen. And so thank you for, for tuning in. God bless you.